Hello, I am Danae Doris and I am the project manager for the American Clearinghouse on Educational Facilities. I would like to thank you for joining our webinar today. ASEF is the Educational Facilities Clearinghouse funded by the United States Department of Education, established to provide technical assistance, training, and resources to public early childhood schools, K-12 schools, and institutions of higher education. ASEF provides resources on facility planning, design, financing, construction, improvement, operation, and maintenance. We invite you to follow ASEF online at acefacilities.org and also encourage you to join the network of professionals already following the educational facilities discussions on Facebook, Twitter, and Blogger. We are excited to have a wonderful presenter, Ms. Jolene Voss Rodriguez, joining us today for this webinar entitled, The Environment as the Third Teacher, Transforming Learning Environments. Ms. Voss Rodriguez currently serves as the Child Development and Education Department Chairperson for Pierce College. In her 23-year career, she has served in a variety of roles which include teacher, early interventionist, and professor. While those roles may have varied, Ms. Voss Rodriguez has continued to be actively involved in efforts to improve childhood education and is dedicated to providing professional development to other childhood educators. Thank you, Ms. Voss Rodriguez, for sharing your expertise with our audience today. Hello, thank you for coming. I'm Jolene Voss Rodriguez and we are here today to learn about the environment as the third teacher. Um, today, when we're looking at the environment as the third teacher, this is a concept that is derived from Reggio Emilia, Italy. I'm not sure how many of you have heard of Reggio Emilia, Italy, but Reggio Emilia is known throughout the world for its exceptional infant and toddler programs in preschools. <clears throat> Each year, thousands of educators from around the world descend upon Reggio Emilia to study their approach to, the educa to education. Um, and this is really exceptional if you think about the fact that nowhere else in the world thousands of educators descend upon to go see their preschool. So um, what are they doing in Reggio Emilia that makes it so fascinating to educators? Um, Reggio Emilia, the approach is grounded in the teaching philosophies of Dewey, Piaget, Vygotsky, Bruner, and also others. And they, when they're talking about the concept of the third teacher, what that means is in Reggio Emilia, they have a team of two teachers or co-teachers. And so they talk about that the teachers are very important, but the environment is also that third teacher. So the Reggio Emilia approach, it's more than just about the environment, but today we're going to just look at that one aspect and what we can learn about the concept of the environment as a third teacher. On our webinar here today, we have some uh, surveys. This is one survey here that indicates your role or position working with children. And I just want to kind of get an idea of who you are and what you do with children. So if you could click on this survey. I have two surveys. This is the first one. Um, so then the responses show up so I have an idea kind of of who is attending. So it looks like here we have teachers, we have some program directors, some administrators, higher education, a couple architects and other. Okay and then the next survey uh, if you could click on this one as well. This one indicates which age groups you primarily work with some higher education so no one from middle school okay thanks I just wanted to as I said get an idea of who's out there okay Anita Ruiolds it was an architect and she also was a child development specialist so she really worked to blend the two fields together and she said here um, she talked about children looking at children as miracles so what we're looking at in this presentation are remodeled spaces. So most schools do not have the opportunity to work with architects and designers to build and design brand new schools and classrooms. It's great if you have that opportunity, if the, your school or campus or district has funding to be able to do that. And then teachers are able to sit down and really work with architects and designers to build appropriate spaces. But often um, teachers inherit classrooms that they need to design and organize themselves. So what are the guiding principles for this design and organization? Um, Anita Ruiolds, I'm going to speak to her a few different times throughout this presentation, and, but she really starts off by talking about viewing children as miracles. And so we really want to design spaces for miracles and not for minimums. The agenda for today 
is why rethink environments, the goal, the overall goal. Um, we're going to look at color, light, organization and presentation. We'll look at learning centers. We'll look at the outdoor classroom just a little bit. And then simple changes that pretty much anyone can make uh, given limited budgets. And then we'll have a question and answer session at the end. Okay. Based on a constructivist approach to learning, we want learning environments that provide opportunities for hands-on exploration. Um, and that means where children are really active in constructing their own knowledge. So these environments should spark all kinds of social, emotional, and cognitive learning. And this is for all age groups. Um, we want learning that supports discovery. We want learning environments that provide opportunities for exploration. <clears throat> we want learning environments that provide opportunities for wonder and amazement. We want learning environments that provide opportunities for creativity. And we want learning environments that provide opportunities for imagination and collaboration. Children in the United States spend thousands of hours each year in schools and in early childhood programs. And yet most Americans have not drawn from the wisdom from outside of the education profession for um, designing the spaces. So a teacher's not typically a trained designer. So where do teachers turn, turn when choosing how to design their space? Often teachers go to commercial educational supply stores or catalogs to choose materials sorry, and furnishings to design and set up their classrooms. Um, the materials that the educational supply catalogs offer, they're typically very institutional in look and feel, and the color palette is often very limited, uh, offering furniture, rugs, toys, materials, mostly in bright primary colors. Um, however, I have seen a new trend emerging at conferences where some educational supply companies are now offering more all wooden furniture and more home-like furnishings. So this is pretty new um, and teachers are starting to get a few more choices. Thinking about what we want for children in the classroom community is really key. Um, it says here that our design shape children's beliefs about themselves and life. In a well-designed area, children are engaged and feel secure. A well-designed area can facilitate predictable, consistent, and intimate care for each child. So we really want to be intentional about the choices that we make for the classroom. This includes the layout of the classroom, the design, the furnishings, and the material choices that we make. The goal for this presentation, and uh, as we're going through the different slides here is just to learn about how to alter learning environments to achieve relaxed, comforting, secure, and aesthetically pleasing environments where optimal learning is supported. Research on brain development has taught us that children's experiences are what develop and reinforce the brain synapses or connections. So the synapses that are not used are pruned. Um, as children's experiences, uh, children's experiences directly impact um, the connections and which connections aren't being used. And so children's experiences are going to be either limited or they're going to be enriched by their surroundings. Therefore, the environment that we provide for them has a critical impact on the way that the child's brain is developing. First, we're going to talk a little bit about color. So bright color versus natural colors. Often early childhood programs and elementary programs choose bright colors for their classroom environments. This is based on research in the past that shows that children are really attracted to bright primary colors. And therefore, you know, you'll see a lot of toys when you go to um, any kind of store, Target Toys R Us, you'll see these, you know, bright primary colors and pink and stuff like that for the, the girl aisles. Um, but you'll see these different colors around that typically are set up for children. Now we've taken this information and we've translated this and we've actually um, created furniture or people have created furniture um, for classrooms front with these bright colors and as you can see these are these are very very heavily saturated colors here and these are just two examples of classrooms uh, with um, cabinets and um, bright primary colors. Well green isn't a primary color but um, we'll get to that in a second. So we all know color affects mood, but to what extent? Fast food restaurants purposely use red and yellow, and these colors stimulate appetites and increase pace. Um, people eat quickly and leave. So color psychology shows us that, um, this about 
the colors, um, using these colors for restaurants. Uh, many fast food restaurants have purposely chosen to use these colors based on color psychology. Um, agreement on color theory can vary. So, but looking at these colors, either way, if you believe in color theory or you don't believe in color theory, when you look at these colors and they're so heavily saturated, I think most will agree that the combination is not that visually appealing. The bright yellow and the bright red. So hot colors, again, such as red and yellow, are, have been shown to stimulate and excite. Bright primary colors, and again, the primary colors are yellow, red, and blue. And these colors provide a lot of visual stimulation to the space. So an example that I can think of is the former Campus Child Development Center here on my campus, when they first um, uh, put chose furnishing and, st and items to go in there, somebody had the idea of putting in bright yellow cabinets, bright yellow tables, and then they had yellow blinds. So we used to joke that we needed sunglasses to go into the classroom because the color was and that was based on the idea that um, we think that children have to be surrounded by these really bright colors. So the presence of too much of the bright color in environment can have negative effects. Um, research has shown that it can make children hyperactive, agitated, and exhausted, causing them to shut down their senses in order to block the intensity of the stimuli. And when we're talking about the primary colors, the red, the blue and the yellow that we typically see in a classroom. We're not talking about like a butter yellow either. Again, they really use these heavy saturations of the color. I want to do a little reflection exercise with you where I want you to take a moment to think about a place where you enjoy spending time just so we can start to think about what would you like to have in an environment? Um, so what colors when you go to the place in your mind where you enjoy spending time what colors do you typically see? What sounds do you hear? What textures do you feel? What do you smell? And overall, how do you feel? So I want you to think about that for a minute. Um, I've done this exercise in many workshops and in workshops people often talk about their bedroom as being one of their favorite places or a soft, comfortable place in their home. Others love the outdoors, they, they really like the smell, the feel, the colors, and the textures of like the beach, or the garden, or the woods. Overall, our favorite places, um, they're linked to our sensory experiences in those spaces. So I don't think many of you probably decorate your favorite place in red, blue, and yellow, <laughs> and bright. Um, primary colors. You might have a butter yellow room or, or a, a faded or a light blue um, room, you know, uh, not such a heavy saturation or concentration of the color um, as opposed to these really bright, bright primary colors. So children, they spend a lot of time in school and three things that differentiate home settings from institutional settings are softness, um, comfort, and color. Classrooms have really become kind of antiseptic and childproof with many smooth plastic bright colored surfaces that can be wiped down. I've gone to classrooms where I've seen plastic uh, couches that they're actually couches that are made from hard plastic or couches that are made from like a vinyl covering you know so they can wipe them down and those are very kind of crinkly and the plastic ones are very hard so not very soft at all. And while hygiene and cleanliness, they're very important, um, there are ways of doing this without compromising comfort and softness. So softness and texture in a space are really important because children spend long hours there. Soft surfaces also reduce noise, and as a teacher, I know that I would like to have the noise reduction to be lessened if possible. Softness and texture also provide important complexity in, for sensory stimulation and that again is key for brain growth and development. We learn through our senses so therefore we need those opportunities to use and refine our senses and we also really want to feel comfortable in a space. So looking at natural colors, so these really soothe and relax children. If you go entered into a spa you wouldn't see bright primary colors, you'd see natural colors and why is that? Because natural colors um, 
promote relaxation and, and have a tendency to, for us to be soothed and calm in those spaces. And it's important because children learn best in a relaxed state. So their brains are primed and ready to learn without distraction from stress, discomfort, or too much stimulation. So we're really thinking about overstimulation here. And it's simple to make these types of changes. So this is a shelf before, which was the bright primary colors, and then after. Um, it's nice to if you can strip down shelves, but it takes a long time to strip something down to the natural wood state. It's really difficult to do. Uh, so painting them was what we did here for this school. So I'm going to show you some slides throughout this presentation of some before and afters, really simple changes that anyone can make. And here we painted these in kind of a sage green. Um, that was a color choice that the teachers thought would be really nice in the classroom and would kind of accent the rest of the classroom area. I've also had people paint shelves in white um, so that when the materials that go on the shelves, those are what add the color. So the children's materials and toys and stuff like that fill up the space and add the color um, to that area. And it's not the shelf itself. Here's a before and an after. This is a preschool classroom. This is actually a pre-K classroom. And before, there were bright primary colors, old carpeting. And if you can see, the windows are blocked there. The um, cubbies were in front of the windows, and then they had the blinds. After, on the right, we painted the shelving. And so that was a very cheap, quick fix. The flooring was the more they're getting rid of the carpeting and putting in new flooring and again we chose a really kind of a sage green to bring in a really kind of a natural feel to that classroom we added lamps baskets plants and we brought in natural light so we moved the cubbies away from the windows and um, took down the old blinds, put up some curtain fixtures that could be closed as needed. Uh, lighting, just like color, light can also influence mood. So there's evidence to suggest that fluorescent lighting may influence overstimulated behaviors. And I know none of us really like <laughs> fluorescing. So bringing in different types of lighting is really nice and important for children. Lighting affects our total body chemistry. I don't know how often we think about this, but experiments um, demonstrate that different colors and intensities of light actually impact blood pressure, pulse, respiration, brain activity, glandular, glandular and metabolic functions, and biorhythms. So research uh, has also shown that exposure to natural light in a classroom can improve academic achievement by 20%. So that's pretty remarkable by having that natural light. So really like just opening up the blinds, that's a very simple thing to do and letting the natural light in. When natural lighting is not available, architects will talk about using full spectrum lighting, which is um, closer to um, natural sun, the spectrum, the spectrum of natural sunlight. If you want to know more about that, you can speak with an architect. It looks like we have some architects on here today. Um, but that's an option for lighting. Very lighting and task lighting is important. So this lighting sets a mood. So you can set light in different areas. Um, you can bring in little lamps. You can have lamps over tables as opposed to having the overhead fluorescent lighting. And um, create little areas with your lighting. So it defines spaces as well. Again, exposure to natural light is really essential to a child's health and development. So try not to block furniture. And I, I find this probably won't, it's very common when I go out and I look at schools. I'll see a lot of desks um, or cubbies. Also, when they're putting artwork, sometimes it'll be big posters, opaque posters, blocking the natural light that's coming in. So try not to block the natural light coming in from the windows. Keep the window coverings open as much as possible. Add windows to spaces when possible. We did that by adding, um, I'll have a picture later on, but we added some windows into door doors so that we could bring more light into a classroom. Uh, it's nice to have light coming from two sides, natural light coming from two sides of the classroom, if that's possible. It's not always possible. Um, create a special place for children new windows and offer many opportunities for outdoor play. I know that's easy where I'm at in California as opposed to some other places. We're also going to look at organization and presentation. So the environments really reflect the attitudes, beliefs, and values of the inhabitants. And this is early childhood environments. But really, 
all environments, not just early childhood environments, our school environments, our learning environments, reflect the attitudes, beliefs, and values of the inhabitants. Here's some before and afters. So this classroom here, this is a preschool classroom. It was cluttered, disorganized, um, and the areas were not very well defined. Here they had, they considered this a library and a computer area on the left. And then afterwards, um, the emphasis is really in beauty, organization, and well-defined learning centers. So that's the same classroom, it's a before and after. Another before and after, again on the left, cluttered and disorganized. And the um, after was, it's well-organized, thoughtful decor. And teacher work areas. This is a, a thing that I have found when I've gone into classrooms that teachers often don't have great working spaces. Um, this classroom, they didn't have a desk for the teacher, they just had a table. And in the back, she had some shelves that were closed up and um, a small little area. And so at this school, um, I had them build these on the right. You can see these um, kind of like a countertop. So it's countertop height. So the teacher's not leaning over, which actually helps their back. And on one side, it's open. So the children had open access on one side. And the other side, it was also open where the teachers were able to store items. And then the same shelves or the shelving behind. What we had done is just cut the shelving doors so that there was open shelving right behind the teacher and then above was some locked closed up cabinet so for the materials the teachers needed to keep locked up and closed up but those sliding doors those blue on the left those blue sliding doors removed those um, and so there's open storage behind that for the teacher as well so this just made it a much more functional work area for the teachers and it helps them to be able to be more organized so i'm really thinking about our teachers and making sure that our teachers are comfortable and that they have spaces where they can become organized. This is another room, um, a before and after. So this one had a divider and we took the divider out and really opened up and made a bigger space um, and also looked at the types of furniture that were in there. Um, before there were a lot of kind of hodgepodge pieces of furniture and so we tried to refurbish what we could. Um, it, we are on a limited budget and just try to um, rearrange the classroom to just make a, a much more inviting space. Learning centers are really important um, for all age groups. So high quality environments have these well-defined learning centers. Well-defined learning centers decrease the likelihood that children are going to wander aimlessly. And we know that when children wander and they're bored and they're not sure what they're going to do, they have a tendency to maybe misbehave or get into things that you wouldn't want them to get into. So um, having these distinct learning centers really shows the child what they're supposed to do in that area. So they're going to be more on task, they're going to engage in that area, they're going to know what to do exactly in that area because the space is going to speak to them. It's going to, when they enter this little area, they're going to, oh, this is the science area, so I know what I'm supposed to do in a science area, or oh, this is the art area, and I know what I'm supposed to do in the art area with the art materials. So it also really creates independence, competence, and a pleasant atmosphere overall for children and staff. And well-defined learning centers for all ages should model organization. We teach children about organization. We talk about organization with children, um, but we don't necessarily always model organization. And this is really important for us to be able to be organized ourselves. And learning centers really uh, do that for us. So having ch child accessible materials and tools, and we're going to talk about authentic materials. I'll have some slides about that next. Um, setting up this environment with intention and thoughtful display. Uh, locating learning centers near one another and rotating the centers as the changes of the projects that are happening um, the curriculum or the projects or the themes might change and also the needs of the of the students. So here's a science center. So this is um, an elementary classroom and this science center um, really speaks to the child. It tells them the intention of this center. 
another science area. They have authentic materials set up in provocative displays. They invite the children to manipulate and explore the materials. And they use real materials, um, which is interesting, but it's also inexpensive. So instead of going out and buying necessarily, well, I mean, there's some science materials, of course, you have to buy, but you can also bring in different things or get things donated from the families to put into your different areas of the classroom. These are light tables. I, I really love light tables, and I think we see them more often in preschools than you do um, with older children, but older children really are fascinated with light tables and love to work with light as well. Here they have, on the left, they have these acrylic tiles that are embedded with natural materials, and on the right you see rocks and agates, a beehive, bugs, leaves, dried flowers, different types of uh, materials there. Or really hands-on exploration. Music centers, this is typically something you see more often in a preschool than you do in elementary, but you want them to be well organized so that children know how to use the instruments with care and respect. Here's another um, two other views of learning center of music centers here. I love that on this little piano on the right there's a framed photo of a child playing a piano. <laughs> Art areas, um, they should have child accessible materials, open shelving where children can find the scissors, glue, crayons, markers, um, etc. On the left you see a child's art cart and on the right is a baker's shelf. In Reggio Emilia, Italy, many of the classrooms had these baker's shelves, these big open baker's shelves, um, and they used those to display the materials for the children to be able to go up and access the materials. This is for preschool age, too. They had these actually even in the infant-toddler classrooms. California, you need to secure those because of earthquakes to the walls, of course. This is just a close-up of that shell, one of the shelves here. And organizing materials by color, it not only models organization, but it's also attractive. So children easily know where to return the items. And then on the right, you see baskets and jars holding materials. This shelf also displays many um, posters of works from famous artists. It's kind of hard to see, but they have famous artists' works also for the children to look at. Again, some more art areas. <clears throat> the children's artwork on the left is framed, um, and then on the right is just kind of a close-up of the materials. Now, interestingly, if you look at the types of materials that I'm showing here, in Italy, in Reggio Emilia, Italy, there's something called Remita, which is a recycling center and um, where they have businesses will donate cast off materials. It could be something that was not made correctly or something that they've discontinued and they donate them to Remita, which is a nonprofit organization. And we have a couple recycling centers in Los Angeles. We have one called Trust for Teaching and we also have the Rediscover Center in Venice, California. There are re recycling centers all around the country and what's really great about these recycling centers is teachers can go in and buy this trash. It's, it's not, you know, like regular household trash, but they call it trash. They can buy this for like a dollar a pound. And it's have they have great teaching materials that you can bring in. And when teachers are on limited budgets, it's really nice to be able to have these scrounged and cast off materials to be able to use with the children. They're stuff that can be put in science areas, art areas, um, manipulatives, the block building area, all throughout um, the different classrooms. So check your city for local recycling centers because they really give good discounts to schools. Um, dramatic play, again, this is typically seen in a preschool more than in um, an elementary. Block building areas, uh, this, we put a big mirror, that, this school had some big mirrors that we found outside and we were able to attach these big mirrors to the walls. And then those are tables where we cut off the legs and, and created block building platforms. Another block area. Reading center, so having a nice quiet area for children for all ages is really important. Bringing in soft materials. They have this nice couch uh, on the left here is one of the, is a community play things couch. And then on the right we have um, different types of furniture there and throw rows. 
Now these are elementary classrooms. So the, these two classrooms are fourth and fifth grade classrooms where they also have couches in the fourth and fifth grade classroom. Uh, and these couches provide comfort and a nice reading area for the children. I also like on the right they have some stuffed animals so the children can just you know get really comfortable right in their own classroom. Some more reading centers. Again, these are elementary schools. The one on the right is the sixth grade class, and the one on the left is, is a second grade classroom. So they have a library in this school, but in addition, they have reading centers right inside their classrooms. Writing centers. Um, we want in kindergarten, preschool, you have these writing centers, which is really great. So children have opportunities for pre literacy exploration. Here's a writing center in a first grade classroom. Here's a close up of how they organize their pens and they put them in these little um, planting uh, cans, which I think are really nice. So, outside, just looking really quickly um, at the outdoor classroom. This was before there was a sand area, a swing set. It wasn't very attractive or very functional, and so we brought in all native plants to the area. So native plants are great because it's low water, um, easy, easy care, and the kids love to water it. This school couldn't afford to refurbish the outdoor structure, so just to kind of tone down the primary look, we took spray paint um, over the yellow and the blue the metal areas and used a dark green to kind of it, it change the look a little bit. We painted the walls around. There was a mural here and, and the ground was uneven and so we built a platform and then a parent did the mural so it was really nice and a parent actually built this platform as well so it's nice to get parents involved for them to be able to contribute you know their skills and expertise to remodeling an area. Now this is really exceptional. This is at a school where they had a pond built. A lot of people can't afford that, but it, it's out in the outdoor area for the kids. Really nice um, area. And they also have a rock climbing wall. This is an elementary school. The kids had pajama day, so that's why they're in their pajamas and they're climbing on the rock climbing wall. Okay, well-designed spaces should reflect the style, cultural values, and architectural heritage of the surrounding community. Each classroom should also reflect the personality of the children and the adults that work there. And so I'm going to show you some simple changes that anyone can make here. So home-like touches. These are garage sale finds, side table, frame picture, basket, a blanket. Um, they can freshen the space by you can freshen the space by adding paint and a natural color. The door on the right, we put plexiglass in it. Again, the classrooms are really dark, and the hallway was dark too. We we're just trying to bring in as much natural light as we could, and so we put um, we put in plexiglass into those windows. You know those doors. I meant sorry. Decorative display reflects the classroom community or the current topic of investigation. These are shelves, little shelves you can find at. Um, the home goods stores or IKEA or something like that and put decorative displays in those. Another display, stone soup was what they're talking about, so different types of bowls and baskets with different kinds of stones in them. This classroom is really beautiful. This is a second grade classroom and they were talking about sea life and so the teacher thought, set up a very hands-on wonderful display for the children. It was so gorgeous and the kids could go up and manipulate the, sh the sea light, the seashells and um, there were crabs and stuff on the, on the other end that you can't see. Really wonderfully displayed. On the right they're talking about birds and this is a first grade classroom on the right. Uh, on the left just some nice decor decorative pieces for a preschool classroom. Using children's artwork to decorate spaces, both of the pieces on the right were made by preschoolers. So they gave them canvas and then the kids were painting on the canvas um, different layers. It was long-term projects and then they um, hung those up as artwork. Garage sale finds and donations 
are really great. And having parents, you know, bring in stuff so parents can bring in throw rugs, um, all different types of objects. More garage sale finds. Baskets are used to organize materials. Getting p parents to donate baskets, a lot of parents, their work have uh, office places have gift baskets that they receive and they can bring those gift baskets in later and it can be used in the classroom. More baskets here. And paint and reuse furnishing furniture. So I showed earlier how we, re how we painted some of the items. So this was repainted shelving. Um, the tabletop I showed you in the block area, we found these tables outside and we cut off the legs and made them into uh, block building platforms. This was a shelf that was just kind of crammed with books and it reminded us of a puppet theater, so we cut out the back and we turned it into a puppet theater. Bringing um, plants into the classroom, that's inexpensive, you can have parents donate plants. Kids love to care for plants and water plants. And then adding sheer fabric to separate and define spaces. So this was um, hanging fabric to between centers and above. It kind of brings the ceiling down. It also, when you have the fluorescent lighting, it kind of mutes the fluorescent lighting. So here's another example of doing that in some other classrooms. And then something else we did that was really neat and, and interesting was we got um, umbrellas from Chinatown and hung those, and those also kind of help diffuse the bright fluorescent lighting. So these are two different classrooms using the umbrellas. Okay, so overall the result that we're going for is a beautiful, relaxed, inviting, comforting environment for discovering, growing, living, and learning. After all, school environmental design should be about what Anita Rui Olds told us, designing for miracles, not minimums. So I know I ran over time a little bit here, but I hope that you've learned that the environment impacts the learner. The environment really speaks to its inhabitants. So we can create environments that offer an immediate sense of welcomeness, you know, the children are welcome in that area, an atmosphere that supports discovery and exploration, one that provides richness and the quality of materials and the type of experiences that will occur in this space. So this is a space where the adults have really thought about the quality of the environment and have intentionally made choices to design for miracles, not minimums. So now what we'll do is have, I'm sure you guys have some questions, so we'll do questions through text chat. Sorry if I talk too quickly as well. Sources are the best to convince stakeholders and community that the environment should be the third teacher. I think really looking at brain research and what we've learned about brain research in terms of experiences, um, our direct experiences with children and the experiences the children are having with materials in the classrooms in their environment are going to impact what's happening in terms of their brain architecture and that is so key and really looking at looking at that and presenting that um, I think to stakeholders in the community um, oh somebody said what about high school students um, high school students you know a lot of the things that we're talking about here permeate all ages. A, a lot of the remodels, pictures that I'm showing here are elementary and, or all the pictures I'm showing are preschool and elementary, so early childhood and elementary, but the concept still permeates all age groups and that all of us learn, even adult learners, need hands-on opportunities. We need these opportunities for exploration. What's really nice in a high school is, you know, having a comfort, comfortable area, a couch where they can really sit down and talk to one another. Having those areas in the classroom where they can do collaborative work. We know that we really learn by teaching one another as well, so having those areas within the classroom for them is key. But I'm going to move to the next question. 
what is the significance of applying interior landscape design to schools? But, um, can you clarify that? Not sure if I completely understand what you're asking me, but I think when I think of landscape design, of course, I think of outside for landscape. I'm not sure if you're talking about plants and stuff like that inside the classroom or if you're just talking about the interior design of the school. Placing plants indoors. Okay, thank you. Um, well, we know that, uh, we also know that nature, I don't know if any of you have um, read any of the recent research on um, really exposing children to nature and getting the kids outside. Um, inside, you know, plants are something that kids really love to care for plants and care for different kinds of animals and stuff like that. To have that in the classroom is really wonderful. Plants are something that you, again, you're learning about caring for something and you have to, you know, remember to water the plant. But it's also um, plants have been shown, NASA will send certain plants with their. Um, inside the rocket ships because the plants actually neutralize some of the pollutants in the air. So this is really um, great to be able to put plants in there and kind of reduce some of the indoor air pollutants as well. So they're getting the benefits of that. Um, plants look nice. They feel great to have in there. And when you walk into a class where there's plants, I think it also feels very welcoming, inviting, and not very in, not as institutional. So it's a place where the learner really wants to stay because they spend a lot of time inside of a classroom. I have another question here. It says, does displaying student artwork on the walls conflict with a calming environment? For example, blackboards for student Halloween jack lanterns, holiday snowflakes, spring flowers, etc. Um, I think it's really important to display student artwork on the walls. Um, there's something called the Early Childhood Environment Environmental Rating Scale. Um, developed by Harms and Clifford and in that they actually look to see that there's more child related display and child work um, child generated artwork on the walls than compared to commercial project um, commercially produced or bought um, products up on the walls when you go into an elementary classroom or even middle school and high school a lot of times you'll see a lot of those um, commercially um, purchased products up on the walls and not as much of the children's artwork and the kids in order for them to feel that it is their community and their classroom where they belong you want to have more of their artwork up um, in terms of blackboards or just or displays for Halloween jack-o'-lanterns and that kind of thing um, that would be a whole nother webinar topic in terms of my how I feel about art but I really think that children's art should be that individualized art should be really should be displayed you know having a bunch of artwork where it all kind of looks the same um, talks might talk about what project happened in the classroom but I also think that children really want to be able to express themselves through art so really giving them materials to express themselves I loved those big canvases that um, some of the preschools have given to the students that I showed two two of those or two different classrooms and the kids just got to create together this beautiful piece of art that can be hung up on the wall and they can really enjoy it but yes child related display and child generated display is really very important to have up there okay it looks like we need to close if you have more questions um, after you can send them to ACEF at acefacilities.org um, and they will and then they'll forward the questions to me and I'll be happy to continue answering any questions that you might have so thanks so much for coming today and attending the webinar um, I hope you found some inspiration for creating your own intentional environment that really supports uh, optimal learning and thinking about the environment as the third teacher thanks a lot ASEF would like to extend a very special thank you to our presenter, Ms. Jolene Voss Rodriguez, and our participants for joining our webinar today. Remember to visit our website at acefacilities.org and follow us on your preferred social media outlet. Please take a moment to complete the webinar evaluation. We value your opinion and look forward to hearing your feedback.